Marvin, I'm gonna appreciate it if you would just go ahead and be quiet. He's back there. My girl dog is here. We got nice views of Shih Tzu's candles and all the uh, fixins. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another Wednesday one shot. I think that's what I'm gonna be calling these. They're just dedicated videos that are gonna be going up on Wednesdays. First of all, how great that my last one worked. It actually helped me find people that I'm looking for. I'm looking for an audience. Yeah, that, that helped me find some people. So hello to all of you who are new, who commented. You know, I'm gonna do my best to not let you down. This one I actually am really excited to talk about. You would think I wouldn't be, but I love talking about it because it fascinates me. So let's grab a coffee. And if you're uh, gonna do this like a podcast and just listen, you don't have to look at me. You can color, you can <laughs> do your dishes. I watch YouTube while I cook. First of all, I think it would be easiest to just explain what agoraphobia is because I didn't know. All I knew was what the movies had shown us. And there is a movie called Copycat from I think the 80s and it is a thriller. I actually always really liked that movie. I always looked at that as like, wow, she really can't go out of her house. That must be terrifying. Like if she even tried to walk out of her house, she would have uh, dizzy spells and really struggle. That is becoming more and more a reality for me. I get it, <laughs> but that was really dramatized obviously for TV and it also didn't do much for what agoraphobia really is because then it confuses everybody into thinking that's all it is and it's not and it can be for some so I want to make it clear that it's not the same across the board for everybody but there is a simple explanation of the diagnosis. I also want to make it clear that I was diagnosed by a therapist, an EMDR therapist here in Seattle, was able to pinpoint it within our first visit. And she, without diagnosing me in a way of saying, this is what you have, she went through a checklist of things and asked me which ones of mine applied. And then she showed me how that was a textbook description of agoraphobia. <laughs> Blew my mind. Blew my mind. I would have never have guessed. I kind of joked. I joked that I had agoraphobia because I preferred to be home but a lot of people I know prefer, prefer to be home and it doesn't mean that they're agoraphobic. So there's some differences. I'm gonna explain all of that. First of all, I'm gonna read it. So this is just from the mayoclinic.org, but if you type in any agoraphobia symptoms or treatments or whatever, it will bring up pretty much the same thing. Agoraphobia is a type of anxiety disorder. Agoraphobia involves fearing and avoiding places or situations that might cause panic and feelings of being trapped, helpless, or embarrassed. You may fear an actual or upcoming situation. For example, you may fear using public transportation, being in open or enclosed spaces, standing in line, or being in a crowd. Most people who have agoraphobia develop it after having one or more panic attacks, causing them to worry about having another attack. Then they avoid the places where it may happen again. Agoraphobia often results in having a hard time feeling safe in any public place, especially where crowds gather and in locations that are not familiar. You may feel that you need a companion, such as a family member or a friend, to go with you to public places. This fear can be so overwhelming that you may feel you can't leave your home. So that is just the textbook de description of agoraphobia. And when she was explaining that, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> That is me, 100%. I remember specifically standing in lines at grocery stores, waiting for them to ring out my groceries in the slow grueling process. Beep, 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 and me sitting there just in a full-blown panic looking for the exit. That has been going on since I can remember. So that made me realize that this goes far back. This wasn't one particular event that can be traced. And this is what we're kind of finding out in my therapy sessions is where did this start? Even my mom was like, I want to know. <laughs> she doesn't know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows where this started from. And that's why we're doing EMDR because EMDR therapy is essentially using a bilateral eye movement system. It's a dot on the screen or your therapist can use her finger to go across the screen. Uh, it's something that makes your eyes move so that as you're reprocessing this memory or whatever it is that you're trying to dig up, it helps reroute the thought from a really negative experience 
to having dealt with it and turning that memory into a more joyful experience or just non-stressful. And it, we do that one by one. So we do it memory by memory. We have not gotten far. <laughs> sometimes I have sessions where I just need to sit down and vent. And sometimes I have sessions where I'm not ready to go deep and dig deep. And I need to just keep it kind of more on like tools. So here are my limitations. I have a list. So if you see me looking over here, it's because I'm looking at my list. Because as I said in my last Wednesday one shot, I want to have direction <laughs> so I stay on topic. Uh, so my limitations are grocery store lines. That's why I do a pickup order. Now I can go to Trader Joe's. This is another thing that's a misconception with agoraphobia. It's not all the time. There's some days where I'm just feeling completely fine. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm fine. I can just go do the thing. For now, Trader Joe's is okay, but doesn't always mean that it will be, will it? <laughs> because anxiety is unpredictable. So you never know if that will change. So you can't say indefinitely, yes, I could go to Trader Joe's. If I go and I have a panic moment or something happens that triggers a panic moment, then I'll no longer wanna go. And none of these things are, I can't. It's just that I'll go and I'll be in an extreme discomfort of anxious anxiety and feelings like I'm going to faint. So who wants to go do that? Most people are gonna be like, no, I'm not gonna do that. That scared me. <laughs> and I know that my life wasn't at imminent risk, but it scared me. And my fear also is I'm afraid I'm going to faint and scare everyone else. Your fear of fear and panic can cause you to avoid a lot of things. It can make you not want to go do the thing. I've been avoiding things and going, nah, I don't want to do that. And if I try something and I have a panic attack, nah, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> There is a particular bridge here that I can't go across. I had a really scary panic attack while driving across this bridge. All right, well, that was probably my worst one yet. I had the worst panic attack going across the bridge. I usually do and usually have to like turn on the AC and count to get across it, which is why usually when I'm showing going across that bridge, I've got music on. I went numb completely numb so I don't know why I do this to myself I am trying not to let anxiety take over when I'm having panic attacks going across bridges and through tunnels but that was bad um, so that was just like the worst absolute worst anxiety I think I've ever had going across a bridge and now I don't know how I'm gonna get home I'm stuck here I guess I'm moving to Gig Harbor. I'm still working on it. Uh, I might be able to now that I have tools, but um, yeah, I had a panic attack on it. So that bridge in particular, it causes some issues for me. If a bridge is low to the ground and slow traffic and short, I'm usually okay. But if it's really high up and as long as all can be, by the time I'm halfway through it, I'm having a hard time breathing. I can't sit in the middle of a restaurant. If I go in somewhere and they're like, here's your seat, ma'am, and it's in the middle of the entire restaurant and getting to an exit or a bathroom or somewhere where I can escape if I need to, I will have a panic attack and I won't enjoy the experience. I've done it, I've had to sit there, but I have to leave. So I had it happen with my dad and family once when we were trying to have Thanksgiving dinner at a restaurant. It was a family dinner, there was a lot of us there, and I was sitting at the table, I was looking around the table, everything was fuzzy, people's voices were really hard to understand. It sounds like everyone's talking through like a tube. Light is like hard to see, I just like, everything becomes kind of fuzzy around you. If you can't breathe, I might even go like super pale, and people might be like, Sienna, are you okay? And as soon as they say that, <laughs> I'm not okay. I will just remove myself from the situation and go, sit outside or just go outside, but it makes it hard for me to even want to go back in at all. And the most relief I feel is when the check comes and it's time to leave. That, who wants to go to a restaurant and have that experience? So if I sit in a booth and it's a small group of people, I can't even do a group. I can't even do a group, let's not lie. <laughs> We're not gonna lie here. I can't do it. I can do one-on-one -on -one restaurants sometimes. And if it's my husband and I know where we're sitting. And usually we just go sit at the bar and we're sober, but we'll go sit at the bar. We get our food to go a lot. My husband's fine with that because he's not, 
he hates really honestly i think he hates eating in restaurants anyway he has his own stuff and his own anxieties but his is not agoraphobia he thinks he's he's like sometimes i can really relate to it though so he he really is understanding of it oh yeah so if i go to a venue or a movie theater i have to sit on the outside so that i'm in the aisle and it has to be close to an exit so i can't go all the way down to the front where it's going to be a struggle to get out because if i start to feel faint i will just hit the floor and i've done that before at concerts where feeling overwhelmed i can't breathe i need to step outside it's a huge crowd to get through by the time i got out to the outside of the venue i was reaching for the concession stand and things went fuzzy and i passed out i just fainted um i was surrounded by emts a bunch of people were really scared that's the thing too when you when that happens that part about embarrassment and that part about fear of scaring people or embarrassing people is another reason why I'd rather just not do it because I don't want to scare people. Falling to the ground and having a minor fainting spell where I do kind of convulse a little bit, it's terrifying. I haven't been on a plane in a long time, but I've flown many times. That's back when I drank. In order to be able to fly, I would have to pregame. I'd have to drink quite a bit at the airport bar so I would get there super early so I can pregame, which always was kind of unfortunate because no matter where I showed up, I was drunk. <laughs> And when I quit drinking, all of this stuff came to the surface and I realized I don't have that anymore. I don't have that as a crutch. I want to work through the symptoms instead of covering them up. And I've always attributed anxiety and all of my little issues as poop in a litter box. <laughs> you guys are gonna hate this, but I look at it as turd in a litter box, okay? And alcohol was litter and it just covered up the turd so you wouldn't have to smell the stink. I've been covering up the turd my whole life. <laughs> I've never just scooped it out and cleaned out the box. So <laughs> in the most disgusting way of describing it, anxiety and what I'm dealing with is me cleaning out the litter box. I'm now doing something about it. It's hard because I'm in the process of doing something about it. And that's a challenging, emotional, very difficult time. And so it's, it's hard but at least I know that I'm working on it. And I hope that one day I'll be able to kind of live my life a little bit freer of this anxiety problem. I feel like I've got a lot going on with my therapist that's gonna help me with that. So I do see a little bit of a light at the end of the pinhole tunnel of anxiety. Oh, getting my hair done. That's the last thing on my, I already said planes. That's the last thing on my list of things that I have struggles with. I'm sure there's more that I'd be like, oh, that's a trigger, that's a trigger, but I just can't think of it. But salons, like getting my hair done, that's another reason why I do my own hair. Luckily, I've become allergic to most nail products, so I don't even have the option. It would suck if I didn't have that problem. I'd be like, I guess I'm gonna go get my nails done and I'm just gonna sit there and panic the whole time. If you have any of these symptoms or have feel these feelings, you'll know that what comes with that is feelings of being a coward or that you are really sensitive or you're kind of being a little bit of a pansy. Like you just feel like comparatively to the rest of the world, everyone's out doing these things and you've got this like problem, like I can't, I can't. Like it just feels like that. Like you can't do things and it makes me feel like a diva. Even when I recently went to the doctor, I went to the hospital because I was having a really bad pain in my side, it turns out I have an ovarian cyst and it was causing a lot of pressure and pain on my back. I passed out while getting an IV. I was sitting in the chair and she gave me an IV and I passed, I told her I was going to and she didn't listen. And so then I didn't advocate for myself and people don't understand. She's like, well, if you do pass out, you're in the right place. And I hear you, but I also told you that I'm agoraphobic and so, I don't think she truly understood that if that were to happen, it would set me back because I'm trying to gain confidence that I can be in control of my body and my panic disorder. I'm working on it and I feel like I've got all these tools and I'm trying to apply my tools to this moment of anxiety and I passed out still. It's, it's really traumatizing to pass out like that. I mean, you're you lose consciousness. It feels like your heart's about to stop. It's it's just a really scary feeling. It, it feels like this is the big one. Like it just feels terrifying. And I understand I'm sitting there having all the grace and sympathy that this is nurse probably is having a long ass day. She's got more important things going on. 
this chick's just trying to get an IV and she's passing out over here, geez, you know, like toughen up. And that's how my brain's working. I'm going in circles thinking she's got more important things, but it would just be nice to get a little bit of that sympathy back from the health professionals because that really set me back. Having passed out in that chair, not being able to lay down. I just wanted to lay down, I was so tired. Now that we've talked about that and just how it sucks because you feel like a coward, let me tell you all the things that my therapist and I are doing that's helping and things that I already started doing before therapy that I felt like really helped me. First of all, when you get into therapy, the type that I'm in with the EMDR, we do this thing that's called parts management and managers and parts work is when you have different anxiety managers that come into action when something is triggered. So say that you're starting to feel the anxiety, you're starting to feel the panic. That manager is saying, hey, I'm really scared. I'm freaking out here. And what we normally do is go, oh God, that's so annoying. You're so annoying, please stop, oh my God. And then you freak out because your anxiety manager is freaking out and you think that's how we have to react. So just puts you in this fit of chaos and the anxiety takes over and you're out of control. So what this does is it makes you listen to the anxiety manager and just say, hey, I hear you, what's going on? And then you can kind of have this conversation with your inner manager. What's going on? Oh, you're scared? Okay, I understand, I hear you. Let's, let's talk about that. What's going on that you're afraid of? Nurture yourself and help yourself get through it or say, hey, I've got this, we're actually okay. Uh, we'll talk about it later and we'll, we'll see what it is that's triggering you, but um, I've got it under control. So no need to, I got you and comfort yourself. When you're not working with yourself, you're working against yourself and it really can spiral. The managers are my favorite part of therapy and it's just really cool because it really connects you to yourself. The child that is inside of you that was hurt, damaged, scared, whatever. That one I cry every time. <laughs> like every time I have to speak to my inner child or little Sienna who was scared and trying to voice that she was scared and I've just shunned her like she was an embarrassment. That's when I will get emotional and I'm gonna get emotional now talking about it because it's, she's just a kid. <sighs> really try not to cry. I can't talk about the inner child, I can't, because I just feel for her. I don't know what yours would be if you're in therapy or if you have it in therapy or what your your uh, the toughest one is, but for me it's the, the little Sienna because little Sienna was scared a lot. It's not something that I blame my parent necessarily for, but there was a nurturing that was missing. Not that I wasn't loved and not that, you know, you always wanna protect your parents when you talk about this kind of stuff, but I think we're, we're kind of still un unearthing a lot of that, but I think it was kind of a just walk it off kind of situation. Um, that nothing is wrong and that you're being a little bit of a pansy. <laughs> and so now um, I, you feel unheard. You feel like no one's listening. This is where I need to find comfort in myself, give it to myself because I can't be the person agreeing with that. I need to be able to say no, she needs to be heard. And then you won't feel this wrapped up confusion of anxiety. Ooh, I gotta, I gotta move past that one because that one's tough. That's a big one in therapy for me. So the tools that I use, finding a safe place within yourself. So you can picture it to whatever you want. I have said on here many times, mine is called the witchy cabin and it's just a beautiful cabin in the forest in a, the most safe forest you can ever imagine. There's a, even, we talked through this with the therapist, but there's even a little bear walking through, but he's harmless. He's a harmless little bear just, sipping out of the pond and looking for a fish, but would never harm me. And so there's nothing there that could hurt me. It's the safest place I can go. I have a fire going. I can go into my little cabin, sit on my couch. I have my dogs, my husband's out golfing because that's what he does to make him happy and that makes me happy and I'm reading a book. Like this is, this is the happy place. And this is a place you can go if you're feeling incredibly anxious and you can't get it under control. And just picture yourself there. 
if you have to. And I've done that driving. I've done that driving down I-5 when I felt really, really scared. Like, ah, oh, everybody's driving crazy. That driver's nuts, ah. Oh. Witchy cabin, witchy cabin, witchy cabin. <laughs> and then uh, the other one, maybe you're going to sleep and you are feeling really like overly anxious and you can't sleep and oh God, I just need to feel okay so I can fall asleep. You can bring in your hero or whoever it is you need that will save you from this moment where you're struggling and mine is the luck dragon in the never ending story <laughs> falcor because i started to get shih tzu dogs um years and years ago because they look like falcor that is one of my favorite movies and i always picture when i'm feeling super anxious that i am atreyu in that horrible scene where there's mud and his horse i can't even talk about it can't talk about the horse scene i fast forward through it every time but when he's at the very end of it and he's just like holding on to that one last twig and he's like help and he's about to just sink under the mud and then falcor comes out of the sky with his little wings which are ears and his tail and he weaves through the sky and he comes down and picks him up out of the mud that's the moment i imagine and it's me and the next thing you know i'm on the back of falcor going yeah and i'm flying through the sky with them and we're all happy again that is my moment <laughs> brings me back to my happy place. You're welcome to use it if you need it. But I would highly recommend therapy if somebody is struggling with agoraphobia. And I know that it's not accessible to everybody. I do have health insurance that luckily is covering my therapy. If there are other resources out there, uh, I would love to hear them if anybody knows for just like, you know, any sort of sliding scale therapy. I do know that you can probably Google that for like a th uh, in your area, what sliding scale therapies are out there. I think everybody needs it if they need to get access to it. I think it's really important. If I ever won a million dollar lottery, I would 100% help fund mental health, help people get more help. Break the stigma that talking about it or even admitting that something is up is you being broken or something's wrong. I would say it's way worse to just live your whole life feeling absolutely horrible and doing nothing about it and not getting help. Obviously there's people out there like me who are <laughs> putting videos up and trying to help. So hopefully it's helpful. But uh, here's some helpful things. So one thing that I really like to do is kava kava, but too much of it I think is bad for your liver. So you have to really drink still again with me and like, I'm like trying to be sober. I still want a healthy liver. I deserve it, <laughs> but I drink it only when I need it. So if I have a trip planned, if I have something going on where I really need a little bit of relaxation and calmness, it almost is placebo for me at this point. If I even just taste kava, I calm down. Uh, when we go on our trip to California every year, there's a few places we know now on the way down that have kava tea from scratch. And there's a few coffee shops and tea houses that will actually have the real deal. So you can Google tons of videos out there on how to make kava. And that could be one of my Wednesday one shots is how I make kava to help me calm down. I also do get prescribed beta blockers and beta blockers help me. It's like a comfort blanket. Just knowing that it's there, that keeps me from my heart rate going so high and overwhelming that I feel like I'm gonna pass out. They don't make the anxiety stop. They just keep it from going above a certain level. For me, beta blockers, take them as needed. Just knowing that they're there is helpful. My dogs and my husband, emotional support husband <laughs> and emotional support dogs, bringing them everywhere I possibly can and I have a hard time leaving them. So when we travel, you'll notice the dogs are always with us because I can't be apart from them and they help me get through the hard times. And then therapy. Therapy has been a big help. Anyway, I think that's the most that I could talk about right now. I do feel like it's a long-winded thing. There could be a lot more to add. I hope this was helpful. Please comment below, share your story if you want. If you need any guidance or help with it, I'll do more videos like this. Uh, maybe we can all be supportive to each other. I think that would be great. So yeah, that's all. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And please do give me a thumbs up and subscribe. And I'll see you on the next Wednesday one shot or vlog that'll go up this weekend. Bye.